Well, welcome everyone for joining us today. It's a topic I'm super excited to dive into. When we're starting to look at how to secure a small and medium enterprise. We're actually gonna be covering this from a couple different angles today because security is a big topic as you can imagine. And so we're gonna be looking at some of the best practices in terms of setting up a really good baseline foundation, kind of all that internal infrastructure as you're starting to think through some of these different pieces. And then we're also gonna take a look at what's happening in the external landscape, kind of what are the threats around us and diving into all those different components. So my name is Chase, I will be your host today and we are joined with a very special guest from our strategic alliances at CrowdStrike, Patrick. Patrick, could you give a quick introduction on yourself? Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you. My name is Patrick Maher. I'm a sales engineer at CrowdStrike and have been working there for a little over three years. Honestly, time has been flying by, you know, ever since our big move to a very much hybrid workforce. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you today, Chase. I'm very excited to talk about how we can really take a better step to secure our environment today. And of course, to do that, we need to understand where those risks lie. So, Absolutely. All right. Perfect. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the topic. And so a very broad question. So how do you do it? How do you start to look at what are all those pieces that you need to think about when you're securing a small, medium enterprise, kind of smaller business? And security in general is kind of like describing a house. Like there's a lot of different components, you know, it, there's specifics you kind of need to triangulate a couple different areas. So because it's so large, I thought it would be helpful is if we kind of take a couple steps back and look at some of the tectonic shifts that we've seen over the years, right? So actually that's kind of a good point, kind of over the three year tenure, um, we'll go looking at about four years or so, what are some of the movements that we've seen and what are those impacts that we've seen from the security landscape, how we think about setting up that. And as we start to come into year ends, thinking about your investments and what does that set you up for 2023? And so to do that, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of, you know, we'll play with some images today and kind of get you a sense of what does that investment in security surface area look like? So coming back four years or so, it kind of looked like this, right? A majority of your time, attention, focus was really around kind of the office space. And even from a mental perspective, that's where you know a lot of the security implementations were because it had everything there. It had all the people, it had the processes. And when you're thinking about that holistic protection, you're looking at it and say, all right, my work is over there. So that I'm gonna go secure work stuff over there. Not to say that you know remote work wasn't already happening. There's a lot of, um, I'd say, digital native organizations or globally distributed organizations already, right? So you had some of those components, but when you think about a majority of the small and medium businesses across, especially North America, but then also globally, it really wasn't the case. Not everyone's you know a SaaS startup and kind of working out of the basement. There were physical locations that we had to be aware of and kind of transition to. And so it was always kind of there, but not really paid attention to, is making sure, okay, you have some best practices, please come in through the VPN when you can, kind of all those other components, but a majority kind of, of the lion's share of your attention, focus, and budget was over on the office space. And then, as we all know, kind of the pandemic helped accelerate this, and it really kind of flipped it on its head. And so now, all of a sudden, you know, how to describe a house becomes really important, because, and you're starting to think, how can we secure someone else's home? And how can we secure, what does that look like? So then all of a sudden, all of these questions start to enhance and because now people are everywhere. They're globally distributed. They're moving into tiny towns all across the, you know, great, what are we doing with all that? So with that, your processes are also becoming distributed. They are all, you know, majority of, I'd say communications and applications, other pieces were already kind of throwing through the internet, going through all those different pieces but a lot of the in-person processes, a lot of those were forced to become distributed as well. So now you have literally all of your communications happening over the internet through different applications, all these different pieces. And then finally, the protection, right? So it's not just this one space, it's literally everywhere. It's multiple different spaces. So you have to think about how you can help people set up and have good practices when they are at home, and then when they're not home, and then when they're traveling or moving and kind of anywhere. And so all of a sudden you have a lot of small, medium businesses that are forced into thinking about how do I secure my organization kind of from a global mindset? And they weren't really prepared for that and kind of going through that. And so really, what are the components that we need to look at and making sure that that was a smooth transition? Because not everyone, you know, it wasn't a smooth transition for everyone, let's be honest. Um, and then similarly on the left-hand side, you know, the office was there, people were still paying rent and you still had some organizations that were coming into the office pretty much full time, but a vast majority of folks that became a much smaller center of how you're thinking about your investment and your security and kind of what that purview looks like. 
And so today, we're starting to see it kind of sell out, right? As we start to close out 2022 and start to look at 2023, we're living very much within, you know, hybrid workspace. Um, and that actually, we did a quick trends report. Um, if you've had a chance to see it, we released it just a couple weeks ago, but we surveyed hundreds of different small medium organizations um, across kind of the Jump Cloud ecosystem. And what we found was that less than half of the users are in the office, right? And so less than half are still kind of going into the office, having that part of that, and everyone else is within that hybrid work zone or working fully remotely. And that's kind of how it happened with Jump Cloud and as, as CrowdStrike as well. So now you have this kind of anywhere approach in terms of how you're thinking about understanding the security landscape and the impacts that that has. So through that quick tour of kind of, you know, okay, what happened over the last four years to kind of understand those tectonic shifts that had such a large impact there, there's also this other motion that was kind of going through that as well, but the pandemic certainly accelerated, but it was this notion of an identity transformation. Because what that move really did is it brought to the forefront that even though you might be sitting in the office and understanding some of those components, really it's anywhere that we need to start thinking about securing and it really comes back into the identity because the identity is one piece, but really it's the access portion of that. Um, and so Forrester did some analysis where 80% of all breaches use compromised identities, right? It's not the identity, it's what they can access that's really important to attackers. And it can take a long time for them to understand and suss that out. And so from a end user perspective, there's also that shift as well. And you think you're going in the office, great, I'm doing my work stuff. I'm gonna make sure that I'm secure. But then as we transition home, it's the same person, I mean, not literally the same person in the images as you can see, but it's the same person sitting behind that laptop, understanding how they can get in, understand and access. And so that identity transformation really brought it home for a lot of organizations saying, hey, it's not this perimeter, it's not the kind of this esoteric thing. Really, we need to make sure that all of the users and all of everything that they are touching is secure. And that's really kind of where we can start our baseline and our foundation into all the different components that we're gonna be talking about and making sure that we have set up for best practices. So. What are the main components, right? So wherever you are, and you're kind of thinking about that transition, one is centralized identities, just making sure all of those identities are put somewhere where you know and you have access to it. You know, we, we prefer a cloud directory, as you can imagine, but it allows you to have so much more control over those cloud identities, no matter where people are. And then the second component is securing and managing those devices. So the laptop I'm speaking to you from today, right, it's the most important equipment that's in, my purview in terms of how we work in all those different areas. Sure, we have you know kind of a dummy monitor and other pieces, but this is the most crucial piece of equipment. So making sure it's secure, it's managed, and it's up to date and patched is also very critical. Then, great, once we have that, we need we still need to get on the network, right? Everything is driven through this. And so you might have had controls put in place for the office setting because that was kind of the baseline. But now how can you teach users to kind of you know, change your router password, maybe even upgrade it? You're thinking about all those best practices so that way no matter where the users are, they're leveraging those technologies at their disposal, whether they need a VPN or DNS, whatever that might be to bring it home. And then finally the applications. Really this is where since a majority of the communications are, this is where a majority of organization's intellectual property now lives. And so this is really crucial aspect to making sure that you're managing that application access as we go through those pieces. But it doesn't stop there. So that's just the baseline of making sure the work is done, but the attacks haven't stopped. And so actually one of the pieces that um, CrowdStrike services, over 50% organizations experienced an AD attack in the last two years, right? And so that's relatively recent. As we start to think about some of those tectonic shifts that we've discussed, Attackers don't care, right? It's still in a server closet somewhere. And so we wanna make sure that we can get active access to that. Because again, that is the keys to the kingdom and making sure that if we have your identity, we now have access into the organization. And 40% of those attacks were successful. And so what are some of the security underpinnings that create that basis for each one of those. So it's no longer just identities, but managing that whole life cycle, making sure from onboarding to offboarding, we understand who has access to what at what time. And then enhancing that with additional protections like MFA. So making sure that if you're challenging your users, you can say you are who you are, no matter where you are in the world. And then up-leveling, again, that network protection. What are some of those conditional access policies that you can put in place or additional pieces of technology to making sure that when they're coming on the wire, it's secure and you know about it? 
and then that last piece, knowing about it, has become the most crucial ingredient to this all. Because as we could start to transition through some of those pieces, making sure you have reporting, compliance ready and set up to understand truly what your users are interacting and going through on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we start to combine all these different aspects, you really start to have this very similar foundation and baseline as you start to put these different pieces of technology put together. So what we did is say, great, what are some of the best practices that we've seen across the Jump Cloud customer base and ecosystem and other places just to have a really good set? And we've been talking through a bunch of these different technologies. So that'd be fun to kind of put it up in a bingo square, or at least my security three by three and where possible try to make it all the three acronyms, right? So these are only the pieces that you need to understand. But again, starting with identity access management, and it really sets the tone for everything else that you start to have within your security posture. Then moving into mobile device management, managing those devices, making sure it's secure. And then on Wi-Fi, it's the only one I couldn't get into a three-word acronym, I apologize, but you have VPN and DNS to kind of switch it out as well but then also moving into those applications, setting up single sign-on for your users. Let's remove passwords where we can and making sure that you have seamless, frictionless access into what you need to get your work done. And then for all those applications that don't have that, let's slide in password manager to making sure you have full coverage now for all those different pieces that your users might be touching. Then let's start to challenge them a little bit. Let's making sure that it's really who they are once they start accessing those critical resources with MFA. And to enhance that motion as well is start thinking about biometrics. Again, making sure that you can do it in a frictionless fashion of understanding who those users are. And then where possible, add in some conditional access policies or cap so that way it makes it easy. If you're going into the office, maybe you can relax some rules on passwords. Or if you know that you're trying to get into crucial resources, it's challenging all the time regardless of where you are in the world. And then the last piece is not a technology at all. But it is one of the biggest gaps that we see within organizations, especially as they think about their security posture, is when people leave, when they say goodbye to the organization. No one writes a ticket to say, hey, I still have access to stuff, right? They will let you know what they don't have access to when they're with the organization. But once that happens, it's really where we start to see you know, the organizational processes that start to break down and really understand, can you revoke access to everything that that user had? So that way the organization is still whole as we see a lot of people still transitioning in and out of organizations. So that is a quick kind of baseline foundation of some of the best practices that we've seen in terms of setting up and making sure you have a good internal security posture. And so now I'm actually going to transition over to Patrick and he's going to share kind of everything that we see outside of that and, and some more of the interesting statistics. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop. And then now is also a good point in terms of if you have questions, feel free to start to add that into the poll in the chat um, and we'll go through and answer those towards the end. So let me... Perfect. Thank you, Chase. Now, as we dive into this today, of course, as mentioned quite a few times, we have an ever-changing landscape. And overall, there are many different risk surfaces that you could identify, depending on an organization's individual setup, whether that's yours or somebody that you're maybe assisting with security today and trying to address where these threats lie. Now, due to this, some of the things today that I'll be covering are going to be a little bit more broad and potentially could cover a wider range. Of course, with security, we want to touch on a very layered approach and enforcing every aspect of that. But overall, I'm going to really, really chime in on the things that stay consistent across the board, regardless of whether we're looking at these different environments as on-premise, hybrid, fully remote, and whatever the future may hold for us. Now, with that, the first thing to know in security trends is it's constantly accelerating. And of course, this is something that everybody's really aware of today, but the volume, complexity, and proliferation of these cyber attacks has been getting faster and faster. You know, our world has grown ever more digitally connected, and in turn, access to our environments and our data has increased. This is constantly going to drive cyber crime and due to global economic impact is going to increase the amount of cyber activity out there. With this, all of the leading adversaries that we're seeing are updating and advancing their tactics, techniques, and procedures, and in turn, achieving a scale and sophistication that makes it very difficult for even organizations that would have originally never thought to be a target, a target in today's world. You know, looking at the past, it potentially took days or weeks for attackers to get foothold in and carry out damage in an organization. But due to that time frame shrinking to those hours and minutes and our attack surface growing and ever changing, depending on organizations needs today and what we have to make do with with the global climate in turn. Well, it's no longer those unlucky few. 
it is really truly everybody out there today that is at risk and in turn needs to focus on security and across the board with this. There are many new ever-changing threats we're seeing, whether that's brand new exploitation methods out there or techniques utilized to go ahead and move low and slow environments, but there's one in particular I'd really like to focus on as a general PSA to all those out there today, which of course has been noted. And that is gonna be something that we'll dive into in a minute. <laughs> I do really wanna to touch on once again, that accelerating landscape just to reinforce what we've seen back in 2018, breakout time differences to what we're seeing today. A little foundation on this breakout time is a metric referring to the time it takes an adversary to move from one endpoint to the next. And the purpose of understanding the attacks out there today and what we need to do to stop them and ensure that an incident does not become a breach type scenario, it is a critical metric. As we look at adversaries out there, they put time and effort into this. There's a lot of sophistication in their organizations and in turn want to get their money's worth out of these attacks. So contrary to what the movies and TV want us to believe, it's not simply they get access to an endpoint and then they start detonating everything they have. They want to get that foothold, to get that value out of it before taking this out. So looking at those breakout times, moving from that first endpoint to the next in 2018, we're seeing about nine hours and 42 minutes at its fastest time. It's 2021, the shortened in time frame to about an hour and 38 minutes from the leading sophistication amongst adversaries out there today. And to keep a little reference there, what we're seeing is an average remediation timeline for InfoSec teams in 2021. It's about 162 hours. But in comparison, that's quite daunting. It's quite terrifying, of course. And it really brings light to two key things. We need to have the technology, the people, and processes in place to identify, understand, and respond to these incidents, to remediate these before they do become that breach scenario. Now, I would love to touch on this a little bit further. We probably won't have the time today, but please reach out if you'd like to set up a call, talk about specifically the threat landscape and what would be most apparent or relevant for your organization and your vertical organization size, as well as technologies that might best fit your risk surface and needs. For the purposes of this, though, as we're touching on it, when we're talking about a general time frame, organization should hope to meet 11060 a minute to detect, 10 minutes to understand, and 60 minutes to fully remediate. Based off of what we're seeing as the current breakout times today, if that is something that you can meet, you're gonna be well prepared to stop any incidents from becoming a breach scenario. And with that in mind, to talk about really different factors that is contributing to this, as we saw that real increase in the attack surface and acceleration of attack techniques. Looking at 2021, about 38% of threats were malware-based and 62% are malware free. As that has changed over time, we saw back in 2018, malware is about 60% of all attacks and malware free was about 40%. So as we see these malware free type attacks increasing, we also do see the decrease in the time it takes for breakout from adversaries and the acceleration of their threats. Now with that in place, let's talk about 2022. Unfortunately, the world is ever changing for us. Now, this time has gone down to an hour and 24 minutes. So they are getting faster. And in turn, we also do see an increase of the fileless attack vectors that they're utilizing, whether that's application exploitation, injection, credential harvesting, the list goes on. But particularly, what I'd like to focus on today is what we see as an alarming trend amongst any kind of threats out there. As Jason mentioned previously, you know, 80% of data breaches have a connection to compromised privileged credentials, which was identified by Forrester's research. This keeping in mind that the longest time to detect overall with threats is around stolen and compromised credentials coming from the cost of breach report 2021. Now, both of these are quite alarming in their own ways. Overall, the proliferation of compromised privilege credentials being utilized in attacks clearly points out that adversaries are favoring this as it makes their life easier and what they're trying to achieve. And overall, the time to detect this is being extended clearly because it is a way for them to stay hidden in what they are carrying out today. And a little basis of how this comes into play, let's look at the attack kill chain of an adversary. Now, traditionally, as you imagine, it would start with initial access. From that point in time, they're carrying out discovery. They wanna understand what they've gotten access to, the value of it from that point in time, what they might be able to move laterally to next and increase that foothold in the environment. 
that follow with privilege escalation to be able to achieve you know, more sophisticated forms of persistence amongst the environment, as well as the ability to go ahead and steal data, carry out destruction type techniques, manipulation, depending on their goal set as a whole. Following up with this, moving into that credential access portion to reinforce their ability to move laterally, spreading that, and then following up with impacts. And that right there is where we see that data manipulation, encryption, exfiltration, destruction type event occur. That is what we'd be referring to as a data breach type event, which of course we want to ensure does not occur. We want to keep organizations safe from that. Now, because of these alarming trends today and the utilization of credentials, what effectively is occurring is an overwhelming trend amongst these is identified by the breakdown of intrusion trends by MITRE here. Valid accounts being used for defense evasion, valid accounts being used for privilege escalation, persistence, execution is also going to be a follow-up from that. And then, of course, the initial aspect here. Now, with initial access, persistence, and privilege escalation, it's a clear indication of why these are overwhelmingly be used in breach type scenarios today. And defense evasion is a clear indication of why this could be taking so long to identify because they effectively have keys to the business. So being able to use a clear indication on how to access our data stores, our servers, move laterally through management consoles, whatever it may be, with no flags being raised because it looks like the individual it should be. And in turn, jumping steps within that attack kill chain right to lateral movement, which is why we see such an increase in that breakout time. And of course, followed up with impact. So with this, what can we really do about it? Well, there are many things we can do. It's not something that we can simply break down overall in one specific thing. We want to approach it with layers. Now, for the purpose of this and to cover both you know, on-premise, hybrid, and, and of course the fully remote environments out there today, really started to summarize this into a general theme. Specifically, there are four key things that are gonna apply across the board, and a majority of organizations, of course, will have the fifth, although I have run into organizations today that do not even have a network in many IoT devices that they're utilizing just because of how remote everything has been set up for them. The first one, though, next-gen antivirus, endpoint detection, and proactive threat hunting, the ability to stop inherently malicious threats out there today, regardless of whether they're file-based or file-less, ensuring protection regardless of whether that vector of attack is coming in, say, through email or identity-based, a uh, user picking up a flash drive in the parking lot, a key piece to keep us protected regardless of what we may see next. On top of that, the threat, the threat hunting looking for the strange and anomalous behaviors being that extra pair of eyes to keep us ready for what we may see next. On top of this, hardening devices, making sure that we're enforcing things such as disk encryption, patching across the board, overall reduction of configurations that are unnecessary or closing up ports, removing bloatware that may be present that leads to unnecessary risk in the environment as a whole, patching down these endpoints, whether it's directly updating the operating system or we're talking about specific applications to reduce the potential risk surface that adversaries can utilize in their attack vectors. On top of that, critically, as mentioned by the alarming trend today, lockdown identities. We need a way to, of course, ensure that identities are not being misused and the means to enforce more conditional access around them. Finally, patching our edge devices. So routers, switches, general IoT devices that we may have sitting out amongst the environment can all really fall into this space here. But if they're present for your environment, making sure that you're updating those, locking down unnecessary configurations within them as well, just to reduce the potential vectors that an adversary can utilize in their attack kill chain today. Now, all of this was very, very much generalized as a whole into what can apply to all of these different threat landscapes depending on an organization's needs and what your environment looks like today. But we would love to take a deeper dive into this. If you'd like to, please reach out to CrowdStrike and we will touch on the intelligence portion and how it directly relates to your vertical, the organization size, as well as what technologies we see organizations within your space typically implement based off of what your workforce is looking like today and what your risk surface may be. With that, I'd like to switch over to Q&A. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for going all through that, Patrick. There's a lot to, I, I certainly have a couple questions as we start to dive into some of those pieces. Um, now's a great time. Feel in some questions already starting to see a couple uh, that are starting to come through. Um, we are actually going to take a really quick poll while you start to have a moment and think about some of those other pieces, um, and then we'll dive into some of the questions that we have.
All right. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for throwing that in. Um, so some of the questions we start to go through are, I think, a little bit more on the external side, because this is a view that we haven't seen, certainly as you start to think about things like a kill chain, how you can hop and cross um, and have a lot more lateral movement across organizations, kind of where that comes from. I think one of the biggest things that is hitting home for us, usually it felt like within that discovery display, right, that's, that's kind of the moment in time where the clock starts for everyone. So there might be automated attacks, other pieces that are coming through, just trying to hit all the easy buttons, which is why, you know, hardening your devices, making sure that they are up to date is really important. Um, but if they get around that and they start discovering all of those different components, well, you know, the time starts there, right? Because they don't know your environment the way that you know your environment. And so that's one of the areas where you can start to think through, okay, if you were an attacker, where would you go first, right? You can, you can start to play, you know, might not have the budget for red team, but you can have a red team mentality of kind of starting to think some of those pieces. But one of the disturbing trends you just showed there, Patrick, is kind of they're now starting to accelerate that and kind of go into a little bit deeper. Um, one of the, the questions that we have coming through is on that initial graph that you showed, there's a lot of different types of attacks kind of starting from viruses and worms as we all knew it um, into more complex like botnets, but then also even into supply chain attacks that have kind of captured a little bit more of the news cycle. Um, I'm curious, are you still seeing some of those um, supply chain attacks as kind of the most critical ones or what are some of the things that you might be anticipating or thinking about as we go into 2023? Absolutely. Now. I guess to, to best address that, I wouldn't say supply chain attacks are the most critical ones because every attack out there is critical. We need to be prepared for all of them, our identification, understanding, and ability to respond to them. I would be comfortable in saying that a lot of organizations may not be as prepared as they'd like to be to address things such as supply chain compromise attacks. And that is just due to an overwhelming trend in more of a legacy approach, looking at primarily just file-based threats such as adware, malware, or ransomware or potentially not analyzing behavioral type attack vectors beyond just what a process is or what a process can do, which ultimately is why we really suggest having these multiple layers in place. You know, on that approach for file-based and file threats that are inherently malicious, that is something that a next generation antivirus solution can assist us with. But beyond that, we need to be aware that there's always gonna be new threats out there today. And unfortunately, if there's anything we learned from the past couple of years, it's that it could be things that we have trusted for years on end, being misused for this malicious activity. So we need that extra layer, that EDR data, and a threat hunting team to be looking for when this occurs, ready for whenever something at this point in time, while it may have been benign and critical to our day-to-day -day operation, is now going in that malicious round. So it's hard to say that there's one thing that is more critical than others. I think if we were to take anything out of this as a whole, it's that the most critical thing is what is present amongst all of your environments, regardless of whether you have end users at home, remote, hybrid, whatever it may be. And that ultimately is gonna come down to two key things, endpoints and identities, the things that stay consistent across the board. Now, once again, not to say you should not put other layers in place, you absolutely should. But as we go into the world we are in today, I know a lot of people will be faced with very difficult budgets, but an overwhelming amount of things that they want to implement to protect their organization and their users. So I do suggest starting with what is apparent across the board if you are found with troubles amongst getting everything that you're looking for today. Perfect. And I think that you hit on an important topic there too, is kind of as we go into that motion, thinking about the budget. So say, you know, we only have so much money to protect this house. You know, what are the best ways to do that? We have a combination of internal tactics, making sure that, you know, devices are hard and making sure that they're being patched, right? So even though they're they're as up to date as possible in terms of how we see them outside in the world, but then also the external landscape. Um, that hits home on, you know, it's a few few different pieces on kind of where to put put that budget as you start to think about that. I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts in terms of when you start to, or even kind of amongst customers that you talk to every day, do you have a sense of what that mix looks like in terms of, you know, is it half and half, is it 60-40, or is, or where people might be planning some of those purchases out in the new year? So in that aspect, that's not something I can really directly address as a whole for what everybody's experiencing. Uh, I would say when approaching these budgets, 
what they're really looking for primarily is outcome versus cost. And while there are many different ways to, to approach an outcome, excuse me, um, we will traditionally sit down, chat with organizations, really break down what their security landscape looks like, where their threats lie, and identify where we may assist them and where partner integrations, key such as Jump Cloud, we can work together to protect an organization and from that assist them overall in their ability to identify, you know, what can I do with what I've been granted today, which unfortunately is always less than they would like for security. That's just the nature, how funding goes. But in turn, what can they do the best with the resources they have to ensure protection going forward and preparedness for the ever-changing world ahead of us? Yeah, and I think that that's another element that we've uh, found within our own IT trends report was when you're looking ahead in terms of security, we actually found that about 44% are going to be reducing kind of the overall security budget or they're anticipating that. And that opens up the door. It makes a lot of organizations nervous. But then we also found that the other side of the house, they're actually not seeing any changes or increasing it. So there's a little bit of a dichotomy even within kind of our own customer base kind of looking at that ecosystem of how people are approaching budgets as they're coming in. Think about security for, for the next year. Um, one other question that kind of came through is um, a little bit more on the technical side. So is there an integration plan between Jump Cloud conditional access policies and CrowdStrike zero trust assessments? Um, so I can give a little bit of insight there in terms of working with the teams as we build out this alliance and integration. And so um, we have an integration today for those that are, are tuning in where essentially, you know, we can make sure agents are running on devices. So if you are our CrowdStrike customer, we have the ability to kind of get Jump Cloud on those devices. And then if you're operating with Jump Cloud, we actually came out with some templated commands to making sure that the Falcon agent can be deployed no matter where users are, making sure that you can have some of those pieces. The question though, of kind of getting into those zero trust assessments. So yes, that is actually um, we plan, we are looking at that right now. And that it brings up an important component of kind of why people would want that because if there's something on the telemetry that we start seeing from CrowdStrike side, then can we invoke other identity-based actions and maybe even some identity-based resolutions before things get out of hand, right? So as soon as we start to see, hey, some of that discovery, hey, that user is trying to look at some other pieces where they aren't typically, what are some of those signals so that way we can make automatic um, essentially security device decisions, or at least making sure that IT and security professionals are put in a good place so that way, seeing all the telemetry, even across um, kind of two, you know, integrated platforms, the data and the understanding and everything else kind of flows into one. So yes, um, that is one of the pieces that the product teams are looking at. Um, and then the next question we have, is there any kind of actions that can be accomplished with policy or automation deployed on Jump Cloud side in response to Falcon detection? How does that interaction work? So I think, again, that kind of comes back into what are some of the zero trust assessment places that we can look into, some of those being places, um, and then a little bit more on the Jump Cloud side. And so because we have an agent operating on the machine, it comes out at root level, we can send those commands, we can update um, and patch you know, the OS as well as browsers and kind of getting into applications in the future, but making sure that not only the device is managed and secured, but it's also up to date. So that way, you know, I think Google Chrome had what, you know, seven zero days so far this year, um, and, and, and it's not done yet. So even larger organizations, as you start to think about that and kind of all the daily usage that is happening on these devices, it really becomes impactful in making sure that you, you know, as you put your house in order, it's a clean house, it's a secure house, and you have all those different pieces um, put to place. Then last question, um, just in terms of managing both those agents, um, and so really kind of making sure that we can come through. So that's actually a question that we'll follow up a little bit more individually and making sure that kind of implementation is all set there. Um, and so with that, I think we, we don't have any other kind of larger questions to kind of cover with this group today. I want to thank you so much for dialing in and tuning in and understanding kind of what are all those best practices that you can start to implement, think about as you go into kind of this natural planning selection that we have, kind of looking at the next year of 2023 and making sure that you're starting off on the right foot. Thank you again, Patrick, for joining us today and sharing your insights and kind of what are some of those batch practices we can implement both on the internal side, but then also think about the external landscape. Well, thank you for having me here on the, the webinar with you, Chase. Always a pleasure to be working alongside Jump Cloud and doing what we can for a brighter future. Perfect. Well, thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.